As I do uh, when I speak publicly, I want to recognize that we're on Treaty 6 territory uh, because the history of colonization is actually tied into what we're experiencing now through this capitalist economic uh, domination of what is public services and what is provided for people, by the people, by a government that's supposed to be representing the people. But before I, uh, I, I uh, continue, I just want to highlight, as uh, Bill stated, there's four main ways of privatization. That's that they sell off crown corporations. So like uh, Bill was talking about, Epcor, Edmonton Telephone at one point was, was a, basically a, belonged to the city, belonged to the people. So that's the, the first and, and main way that they could just sell something off and just privatize it, just the whole thing, just sell it off. Uh, and it's referred to as just kind of selling the family jewels kind of thing, right? Second uh, is um, by contracting out. And, and Bill made mention of that when it comes to uh, cleaning services at either the hospitals or, and I'll go into more depth than that when I talk about what's happening at the <coughs> University of Alberta. Uh, third is a kind of voucher system where the government will say to you, okay, well, you want, you want a particular uh, service, well, we're going to give you this voucher, then you go to the private co company, the private company is going to provide you the service. Okay? And then finally uh, is load shedding, uh, which is mainly what the Alberta government is doing with uh, post-secondary education here in the province of Alberta. It's just saying we're no longer going to fund post-secondary education. So basically what's happening is that in the last fiscal year, the, uh, the government of Alberta basically cut $17 million from the University of Alberta's budget. It hit us hard. It hit us very hard. So through the support staff, or the support staff at the University of Alberta, there was over 88 layoffs <coughs> in last year. And then, as I'm sure that you may have heard in the, in the newspaper, or on the radio, or on the television, is that they were offering voluntary severance packages to support staff at the University of Alberta. 99 voluntary severance packages were offered in the last year. The year before that, it happens to be that there was also 99 uh, voluntary severance packages. So you're kind of getting the idea is that they're just, the people who are being affected by these cuts are support staff, well also the academic staff at the university, <coughs> but mostly the support staff at the University of Alberta. And actually there was a past member that's right here in the room, Brett over here, was a support staff of the University of Alberta and uh, was laid off. I came back, but then I left. <laughs> <laughs> but there's the, there's the real face of the privatization and, uh, and his wife is right beside him and you can all see that she's expecting a baby. This is the reality of Albertans lives, right? People that are trying to make, put to, you know, have families, get, get established. These are the people that are being affected. It's real people. And I think that that's some of the things that we forget to think about when we talk about privatization is that although these are, you know, you get into these economic discussions about how much money and the bottom line and this and that, at the end of the day, it's affecting real people. And that's why we need to stand up and fight for this. So load shedding, the, the, Al the Alberta government in this fiscal year is going to be cutting $58 million from the University of Alberta's budget. So if you thought 17 was bad, well, 58 is going to be that much worse. And they outright came out and said, look, the people who are going to, get who are going to be affected by this are academic and non-academic staff at the University of Alberta. Your salaries, your benefits. Now, when we talk about benefits at, as part of a job, that's part of the compensation package. That's what you're getting paid. It's not as if, okay, well, you, this is your salary, and then on top of that, we're, we're going to be really nice and we're going to offer you benefits. No, the union is here to represent workers and, and bargain on their behalf on a, in, in a collective bargaining period so that those benefits are part of the compensation that each worker gets, okay? So it's not just your salary, you're getting these benefits in another way, right? 
whatever those services may be, right? Whether it's for glasses or dental or whatever the case may be, this is the way that we compensate the people that, that, that are working for the University of Alberta. It's worth mentioning, isn't it, that the fact that uh, those benefits are won is often at the expense of better compensation financially. Mm -hmm. We're actually paying for it anyway. Most definitely. And, and, and I was, I'm going to go into that, is, that, is the fact that during a collective bargaining period, often what will happen is that uh, you're, you're basically you're, you're bargaining, okay, well, what's your raise going to be in a year? Now, at the University of Alberta, we get a 1.65% raise every year. So when you factor in inflation, which is roughly 2.7%, yeah, 2 how much money are we making every year? Zero. Our increment is zero. And not just zero, but it's actually negative. That means that the box of cereal that I, have to buy, that I buy my son is costing me more money than it did a year ago. And the year before that, and the year before that, and the year before that. There's less cereal in the box, too. <laughs> So this is the reality of how privatization is affecting real people. Now, I'd like to go into more uh, detail about what happened with uh, Rod Fraser, who was a past president of the University of Alberta, and he decided, and this is the thing, that it's a catch-22, because the Alberta government is saying, okay, we're going to load shed, you know, <clears throat> we're not going to give you any more money, even though, through royalties and through potentially a progressive tax system, it could pay for the university to function at, with, a, with the budget that it needs. It could do it. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a false crisis that they're creating. This is the reality. Um, so Rod Frazier says, okay, well, in order to privatize, the way of privatizing is to contract out. So probably <coughs> half of the buildings that were on the University of Alberta campus at the time, they said, okay, facilities and operations workers that are unionized, what we're going to do is we're going to take half of them, we're going to lay off those people, and we're going to bring in a private company, and they ended up bringing in B-Clean. So let me tell you the story of B-Clean. B-Clean comes in, it has half of the buildings, and then all the newer buildings that are being built on the University of Alberta campus, because you go there, they, they got money for infrastructure. They got money for infrastructure. They're building buildings. Well, you can believe that. You can see it with your own eyes. <coughs> Those new buildings are going to go to B-Clean. They're not going to go to facilities and operations workers, union workers. So what ends up happening is B-Clean comes in, and they don't have the best track record ever. Right? <clears throat> they start hiring uh, new Canadians, you know, new immigrants. And the struggle's not with them, of course, right? They start bringing in temporary foreign workers. But what ends up happening is, they, do, they stopped paying their workers. So about two years ago, there was a big campaign on the University of Alberta campus where there was uh, four temporary foreign workers that were owed somewhere in the ballpark of about $160,000 amongst those three workers. And there was uh, some new Canadians. <coughs> but what was happening is that the supervisors that were representing B-Clean were treating the workers very unjustly. So at that point, uh, a group of students and, and staff that were working at the university, uh, as well as the workers themselves, and um, another union, the Justice for Janitors Union, we started organizing on campus. And I'm going to get a little bit into um, <coughs> how, do we, how do we deal with privatization? And, and Bill was making mention of this, is that there's only two, there's there's two things that we have to consider, and that's will, do we want to do it, and then coordination. <clears throat> that's the only thing that we need to determine if we're going to fight privatization. Do we have the will to do it, and can we coordinate how to do it, right? Always from our actions learning how we can do it better the next time, better the next time. This, and I don't think this is anything new. I think that a lot of you know it, but there's a difference between knowing what you got to do and actually doing it, right? So 
with a coalition on campus, we started, all we did was we started organizing tables. We put tables up in specific buildings all around the University of Alberta campus, and we started handing out information and getting people to sign postcards. I'm going to tell you about this postcard in a minute. We, we, we asked people to start signing postcards, um, and then those postcards were then going to the University of Alberta administration, to President Indira Samarsekar. So, you know what, I can't even remember how many postcards we ended up getting, but it was in the thousands, right? But that, mixed <coughs> with the actual tabling in different buildings uh, in two consecutive days on a regular, and what we did is we organized student groups because the student groups could book the tables and the spaces. Private groups outside of the university couldn't do that. So by building the coalition, by building solidarity between the different movements, and sitting down and talking workers and students and trying to figure out how we could do this, we came up with this plan to simply table. And we thought, okay, well, let's just do that. Let's just table for now. We'll get this postcard signed. <coughs> but it worked. Because what was happening was that people from all over the campus, whether it was students or whether it was staff, and even <coughs> probably administration themselves, were walking through buildings and seeing, oh my God, like what's happening here? These guys are talking about how how workers here on our campus are being unjustly treated. And that was the ticket. Then the pressure went to Indira. Then the pressure went from Indira to Be Clean. I said, clean this mess up now. Clean it up now. And let me tell you, Be Clean paid those workers off. They were all paid off. Temporary foreign workers, well, they ended up, uh, their, their issues were, were solved new immigrants, new Canadians that were working at the University of Alberta, uh, their, their issues were, were solved. But most importantly, what I learned from that campaign were the personal relationships. Because now I see students and my, myself walking through Hub Mall, seeing those workers from Be Clean, and we're saying hello to one another. We've managed to build solidarity led to true relationships. And we're going to continue those relationships. So, because we're being cut at, as NASA support staff at the University of Alberta, we decided to put together a, uh, a postcard campaign asking the government of Alberta to restore funding to post-secondary education. <coughs> we're using the same strategy. We've been tabling. We've managed to get almost 2,000 cards just from the tabling and then from the members themselves. They've been able to go out to family members and get an additional 2,000 cards. So we have roughly about 4,000. The idea is that we're going to present to this, these to the government uh, as soon as the spring session of the legislation opens. On the 5th, and our media strategy is to tell them, hey, put the money back. I mean, even though they're going to they're be presenting their budget soon, but hopefully we can show them. The great thing is that there's cards signed from uh, citizens and residents from all over Alberta. So it's not just an Edmonton-based uh, campaign. And before actually kicking this off, I talked to Bill, and Bill was like, hey, special secret. Put this little box in the bottom corner, and it says, I want to be contacted about this campaign and others like it. So what we're doing is now we have a network, we have emails that we can build a network from of more than 400 people that want to know about this campaign and others like it. So next year we launch another campaign and we keep hitting the government with campaign after campaign after campaign. Now I don't think this is anything new because the Council of Canadians is really good at doing campaigns. Um, but I just wanted to share what we were doing in terms of, of uh, responding to privatization. The last, uh, before I finish though, I just want to say one last thing. And that, and that is the fact that this privatization, and Bill alluded to it, is the fact that this is an ideological attack on public services. It's an ideological one. What requires an ideological response in order to fight back, right? And I, I know that you guys are thinking about this. I know that you know it. We can't just be saying we were fighting something. We have to say, well, what we want to build. And I know you've heard it before. But bringing people together through solidarity 
and if we're building those relationships, we need to start asking ourselves, what are our values? What are our values? And what ideological stance are we going to take when it comes to responding to privatization? Now, I'm not saying that all of us got to go out there and join a political party and tow party line. That's not what it's about. However, yeah, it would be great if more people joined parties. <laughs> because that is, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll stress this, the sole function of a political party is that it is a political instrument to attain power. Attain power in the political system so that you can then begin legislating. You are the ones that are making the laws. Right? So the question is, what political party are you going to support? Or are you going to sympathize with? Are you going to support? Are you going to become an activist for in the next election? <coughs> and I'm not trying to say that being democratic is only about election time. Because it's, of course it's a much more than that. We're fighting privatization daily, as Bill was alluding to. But that's part of it. So then there's the political party, and then there's the social movements. And a lot of the times we get into this discussion about the dichotomy between political parties and social movement, and which one should we be working for, and which, and I'm saying it's both. It's both. And I'm tired of that argument. It's like, which one should we, should we be in the party, or should we be in the social movement? The social movement it was, is what keeps the party in check. Right? So this is what's happening right now. We've got a political party whose ideology is to privatize. It's to take capitalism to its extreme, and that free market enterprise dominates each and every part of our lives. And as a, a good friend of mine, Ricardo, was telling me the other, what presented the other day, he's like, imagine 20 years ago, you walked out of your house, you saw a public service worker working on a public road, you'd go and you'd go to a hospital, or you'd go to your school, which was public. Even if you wanted to go buy a bottle of alcohol, you went into an Alberta liquor store. You got to see the public institutions all around us at work. Now fast forward to today. You walk out of your house and it's a private company sitting there doing those services for you. Our schools are turning into P3s. Even the parts of our, our healthcare system, the labs and, and all that and whatnot are being privatized. So we need to start thinking about what are our values? What is going to be the ideological response to privatization? And because I'm running out of time, I'll simply state very quickly that that's the big picture. There's also an inside picture, and that is, once we have identified those values, it's how do we embody them daily? Because we get nothing out of, out of writing excellent policies or stances, right, about feminism or anti-colonialism or anti-oppression. But if we don't live that, then what are we doing? We're still living in the current system with those behaviors and those attitudes instead of really working towards building the new world we want to create. I'll leave it at that. Thank you.